The asset mix most commonly used by investors all around the world is the 60-40, that is 60% of the portfolio is in equity while 40% is in bonds. And over time, I too have a lot of comfort with the 60-40 mix with equity split further into large, mid and small cap funds. Now the last one year has been a happy hunting ground for equities with the large caps, the mid caps and small caps growing by 43%, 70% and 103% respectively. This sudden bounty, although very welcome, has also messed up my targeted asset allocation which has now moved from a 60-40 to a 69-31. So what's needed now is for me to get back to the targeted asset allocation which can be best done using a technique called portfolio rebalancing which shall be our topic of understanding in this video. With that being said, let's begin. Rebalancing is the process of buying and selling parts of your portfolio with the objective of setting the weight of each asset class back to its original state. Let's understand this with an example. So say you start the year with a portfolio of 10 lakhs, which is perfectly balanced with 6 lakhs in equity and 4 lakhs in debt. Now equities happen to do really well throughout the year and at the end of the year you find that the equity portion of your portfolio has jumped from 6 lakhs to 7.5 lakhs while the debt part of your portfolio went up from 4 lakhs to 4.5 lakhs. So overall your portfolio grew from 10 to 12 lakhs and from an asset allocation perspective your portfolio's equity portion is now at 62.5% while debt is at 37.5% which means equity is 2.5% in excess while debt is short by 2.5% and this is where rebalancing comes in because to get the asset mix back to 60-40 you will have to sell 2.5% of equities and buy 2.5% of debt to get your portfolio back to its original state. Now a question that might prop up in your mind is why do this rebalancing in the first place? It's a perfectly valid question and the best way to understand this is to examine with some actual data. So what we have done here is to take the last 15 years of nifty data and we've played out two scenarios. The first one is where we don't rebalance the portfolio and the second scenario is where we do rebalance the portfolio. For this study, we have taken the year closing Nifty 50 index values which represents equities and the Nifty 10 year benchmark GSEC index values which are a good proxy for our bonds. We start our wealth journey on 31st of December 2005 with the Nifty 50 at 3001 points and the 10 year GSEC at 772 points. At this stage, we invest 100 rupees, which is then split in a 60-40 ratio with 60 rupees going to the Nifty 50 and the balance 40 rupees into bonds. The initial years in our wealth journey, that is 2006 and 2007, were phenomenal years for equities, which grew by 32% and 55% respectively, while debt grew by 5% and 7%. As a result, our equity investment more than doubled in a matter of two years, which also resulted in a complete disarray of our original asset allocation, with the new allocation changing to 73% in equities and 27% in debt. More importantly, this 73-27 split meant that our portfolio had acquired a lot more risk than what you might be comfortable with. Now when we extend this table all the way until 2020, we observed that barring the year 2008 when equities took a huge dent, in all other years the equity proportion of our simulation portfolio was always higher than the targeted 60% allocation. And that's because equities tend to perform better over bonds over the long run and by not rebalancing one's portfolio, there is every likelihood that the portfolio will start tending more and more towards equities. All right, if this part is clear, let's move to scenario two, where we'll use the same data, but this time we'll apply a layer of annual rebalancing on top of the asset allocation. So let's start from the very beginning, 2006, and we see here 
that the investment portfolio has grown to 121 rupees in our first year with the equity debt ratio moving from 60 40 to 65 35. Now the principles of rebalancing require us to bring this ratio back to 60 40 which can be done in two simple steps. Step 1 is where we split the 121 rupees into the targeted 60-40 ratio. So the targeted equity proportion is 72.6 rupees and the targeted debt portion is 48.4 rupees. And then is step 2 where we calculate what needs to be bought and sold and by how much. So for 2006 there was a difference of 6.4 rupees between the actual and the targeted allocation. This means we have to sell 6.4 rupees of equity and buy 6.4 rupees worth of debt to ensure that we move back to the original allocation of 60% equities and 40% debt. Now this adjustment, this rebalancing needs to be done for every year and when done our wealth, our 100 rupees would have grown to a healthy 462 rupees by the end of 2020. What's important to note here is that with rebalancing, our portfolio would have grown to 462 rupees and without rebalancing, our portfolio would be a lot lower at just 385 rupees. That's a difference in returns of 1.3% per annum over 15 years, which is quite a bit. So let's take a couple more minutes and figure out why the rebalanced portfolio has done so well when compared to the non-rebalanced portfolio. The secret to this lies in how the portfolio has behaved in two distinct phases of the stock market. The first phase is what we call as the bull phase, that is the period between 2006 and 2007, and then a much larger chunk of time which extends from 2010 to 2020. During these years, the stock market was either flat or was mostly rising and as expected, this was the time when the non-rebalanced portfolio performed better than the rebalanced one, although the difference in performance was not much. But the part I really want to emphasize is the one in the middle, the 2008 and 2009 period. This was the time when the stock markets had fallen like a pack of cards in 2008 only to stage a remarkable recovery the very next year to end up a lot better than what people would have generally expected. Now what's significant here is that if we had rebalanced our portfolio on the 31st of December 2007, then we would have started with a lower equity and a higher debt proportion in our portfolio. And this would have been perfect for us because in 2008, not only did equities fall by 50%, but the long-term debt portfolios grew by 27% during the same period due to the sudden fall in the interest rates. Which means a rebalanced portfolio would not only have been less impacted by the fall in equities, but would have also compensated for that loss with a spectacular performance on the debt front. Now 2009 was a lot different from 2008. It was as if someone had just flipped a switch and equities grew by 76% while bond returns fell by 12%. But the wonderful part is that a rebalanced portfolio would have still taken the fullest advantage of this scenario by stacking more of its portfolios in equities at the end of 2008 and less of it in debt. So if you look at this over the entire 15 year period, it was these two years, 2008 and 2009, that really showcases the importance of rebalancing and explains how rebalancing can reduce a portfolio's risk exposure and at crucial times bring a major upliftment to the portfolio's performance. Now this concept might be a little confusing if you are hearing it for the first time, so we'll request you to kindly go through this section one more time until you feel comfortable about it. And if there are any questions at the end of it, then do post them in the comments box below and we'll try to address most of them. There are three types of rebalancing triggers that investors can use. One, a time trigger, that is you set a schedule like a month, a quarter or once a year. Two, a threshold trigger, which happens when the portfolio deviates from its target asset allocation by a predetermined percentage like 5%, 10% or 15%. 
And the third trigger is a combination trigger which combines time and the threshold trigger. In our opinion, it is this third strategy that is the combination of time and threshold that works best when it comes to rebalancing. And the workings of this are pretty simple. You monitor your portfolio on a set time schedule, but you're also flexible in terms of allowing for unscheduled rebalancing if the allocation deviates from the tolerance target. For example, if you go back to my targeted asset allocation, that is 40% debt and 60% equity, which is then split as 35, 17 and 8 between large, mid and small cap funds. Now my time trigger is that I tend to rebalance once a year and I typically do that in the month after receiving my annual bonus which is generally in June or July of the year. But I also have a threshold limit which gets triggered if any of these four assets were to move by 5%, that's 5% up or 5% down. So if we see what is happening now, debt has moved considerably and is 9% from the target and the mid cap and small cap allocation is up by almost 5%. So it's almost touching the tolerance limit, which means a rebalancing event has been triggered on my current portfolio and it would be in my interest to do a rebalancing right away. Having said this, let's quickly summarize the steps that need to be taken here. Step one is for you to have an asset allocation plan and the best resource you can find for this is the asset allocation video on the ET Money YouTube channel. Step two is to create a rebalancing plan wherein you can define the time trigger and the threshold trigger. And finally, step three is the actual tracking of your portfolio and the execution of a rebalancing exercise. As a part of execution, there are a couple of areas that one needs to also take care of. Firstly, you will need to know which funds you would like to retain and which ones you would want to redeem. And if this part is a bit confusing, then do access the ET Money Fund Report Card, which makes it very easy to select the right funds. And the second area one needs to be mindful of are the cost implications of rebalancing. And by cost, we mean the tax implications like capital gains and also other fees like brokerage, exit loads, etc. So these are the steps and some considerations to rebalancing. And while it may sound a little complex, it does get a lot easier to do once you've tried it out a couple of times. Now I mentioned earlier that I prefer conducting my rebalancing exercise after receiving my annual bonus. The reason for that is that it allows me a bit more flexibility in the rebalancing process. In other words, instead of having to sell some stocks or debt, and having to pay taxes on them, one can use the annual bonus, which gives you an option to buy more of the deficient assets rather than selling the excess ones. It's a good option to have, and that's why I prefer the post bonus period, but it doesn't mean you need to stick to that. So feel free to assign any recognizable date, like the first week of January or your birthday or any date of your liking for doing your rebalancing activity. The frequency of rebalancing is a matter of choice. You can choose to do it annually, quarterly, or even monthly. But remember, the more rebalancing one does, the higher will be your rebalancing expenses like trading costs, capital gains, and exit loads. Our suggestion here is that investors should rebalance their portfolio once a year. Along with convenience, an annual rebalancing also allows you to use the tax structure smartly, which can be done in two ways. A, you can use tax loss harvesting to get rid of the weaker securities and B, you can delay the sale of some equity to beyond one year, which reduces your capital gain from 15% to 10%. In addition to time, one should also be careful of the tolerance limits, which preferably should be within the 5 to 10% range. Again, smaller the tolerance limit, the higher will be the number of rebalances, which will again push up the cost. Generally, an investor should have one or two rebalances per year, which is more than enough and would be the ideal frequency to ensure your portfolio returns and risk are balanced and in line with your risk appetite. On the face of it, rebalancing might seem counterintuitive. After all, it requires investors to sell parts of an asset class which has done well in the past 
and to replace it with an asset whose recent record has been relatively poor. Now this argument might hold in a trending market but when the tide turns as it did in 2008 and 2009, the rebalancing strategy is more than capable of reversing the situation which can then lead to massive performance gains and better risk control. Of course, since we don't know when and how long a market will trend or revert back to the mean, rebalancing does require a strong commitment on the part of the investor. So here's our take on rebalancing. Firstly, treat rebalancing as a process much like how you invest in a disciplined manner using SIPs. Secondly, understand that rebalancing is more of a risk control tool which means over the long term, it can bring about significant reduction in volatility, but it might also slightly reduce your returns. But overall, you'll end with a better risk adjusted return on your portfolio. And with this, we come to the end of this video. We sincerely hope you liked this presentation and would use the contents of this video to set up your own rebalancing schedule. Don't forget to subscribe to the ET Money YouTube channel and share this video with your friends and family members. Thank you for your time and I look forward to catching up with you next week with another insightful video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.